brought your Bibles today, I want you to turn to the book of Matthew. Uh, we are going to be in Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to read a, a very popular passage of Scripture that many have misinterpreted, and uh, it's, it's gotten the church in the place that it is today. But man, what a powerful passage this is. We've been in a series called Change Your World, and this entire series started with the concept of Jesus being a change agent. And if you want to see change in your life, if you want to see change in your marriage, if you want to see change uh, in any environment, put Jesus in the middle of it, and he'll bring change to it. Uh, and then we talked about changing our minds, changing the way that we think. We don't want to just think how the world thinks. We want to be uh, transformed by the renewing of our minds. And then we talked about changing our world by bringing order. And it starts, change starts with our junk drawer. It starts with our garage outside. And then it works its way into our neighborhood. And change begins from the inside and works its way out. Then last week we talked about changing the world by changing our environment. And it's way easier to exercise your willpower to change your environment than it is to try to decide every time a temptation comes if you're going to do it or not. Change your environment. But this week, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about churches that change the world. Churches that change the world. Wave at me if you want to be a part of a church that actually makes a difference in the world around you. Come on. Yeah, I want to make a difference in our world. I loved what was just mentioned a moment ago about foster care and, and adoption. And I, th those are things that make a difference. I want to be a part of a church that truly is the salt of the world and the light that's on a hill. Uh, churches that do not make a difference in our world are churches that are lukewarm. Elbow somebody and say, God can't use lukewarm churches. Come on, he's looking for fiery churches, passionate churches, churches that are filled with, with a sense of passion. It's hard for God to use a sleepy church, hard for God to use a lukewarm church. Jesus said, look, I can't do anything with cold or hot. Uh, I, I would rather you cold or hot, but if you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. But he also can't do anything with divided churches, disunified churches, churches that quarrel, churches that gossip, churches that slander, churches that fight one another, churches that kick outsiders out. He can't use churches like that. He also has a hard time use, using churches that are not focused on outreach, churches that are not focused on missions. And I look across the landscape of the world today, and I see churches that make big differences. I just got an email from a friend who pastors a church in Nepal. And there in Nepal, they're engaged in rescuing uh, ladies that are being sex trafficked from Nepal into India. And every day, they rescue between two and five women who were being sexually trafficked. And all of those women potentially give their hearts to the Lord and become a part of the church there. And I'm like, man, what a game changer that church is. I look at my friends, uh, like in, in, in California, I was just reading something about the Dream Center in LA and, and the Barnetts there, and what a massive difference they're making in the cities of Los Angeles. But I look right here, and, and, and I see when things like hurricanes happen, uh, thank God for the government, thank God for organizations and nonprofits that do great things, but it's the church that shows up in moments of crisis that are the ones that really make a difference. And guys, I just want to encourage you, you are a part of a world-changing church. And, and, and that's how we want to continue to be. But let's look at Jesus' instructions. This is the very first time that the word church is mentioned in the New Testament, ecclesia, and it comes from the mouth of Jesus, and it's the law of first mention. When something is mentioned first, it has its most poignant revelation. And so let's read this passage and extract what Christ thinks is a powerful church. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now this is quite a long time after he had called them his disciples. He's done so many miracles. He's said so many prophetic words that were proven true. I mean, Jesus has proved over and over again that he is the Messiah, but he finally wants to disclose officially to his disciples that he, in fact, is the God incarnate Messiah. And, and, and so this is his passage where he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? Verse 14, well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, and I love that Simon Peter is always the one to talk. 
Uh, like literally, he's always the one to talk. Jesus said, uh, you know, he's walking on the water and Peter's like, Lord, if it's you, I want to come to you. And he's the only one that steps out of the boat. Uh, on the Mount of Transfiguration, there, Peter, James, and John are up there, and God's revealing the, the glory of his son. And Peter blurts out, and he says, oh, this is awesome, Lord. Let us build three tabernacles, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He's always just blurting out. And, and, and Jesus one time was saying, I got to go die. And Peter said, Lord, it'll never happen like that. And he said, get behind me, Satan. You know, So Peter's always the one to, to, to have a declaration. But God wants to use that kind of declaration, that kind of faith. And so Peter's the one that blurts out once again. He says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. And, you know, that draws our attention to the fact that nobody can call him Lord unless they are drawn by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit within us that identifies him correctly as the Messiah. Flesh and blood has not revealed this, but this has been revealed by my Father. In verse 18, now I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Notice this, that this is a play on words. Peter correctly identifies Jesus, so Jesus correctly identifies him. This tells us something about our identity, that when we correctly see who he is, then we can correctly know who we are. And instead of trying to figure out who we are, we need to figure out who he is, and he'll tell us who we are. That's a whole word right there. Stop worrying about your identity and worry about his identity. Worry about who he is. And when you say, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, then he will look at you and say, and this is who you are. Verse 19, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Jesus in this passage gives us four clear definitions of the type of church that's going to make a difference. The type of church that's going to change the world around them. The first is churches that have a strong confession. Confession. What's coming out of your mouth? What are you saying? What are you saying that you believe? Uh, it's not just enough to believe it in your heart. Romans chapter 10 says, it's, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. And Peter openly confessed, I am a believer that you are Jesus, the Son of God. What is your confession? First, what is your confession about Christ? Uh, I, you don't have to say it out loud, but if you believe with all your heart that Jesus is who he said he was and that he actually did come in the flesh, that he actually laid on the cross and died, that he went into hell and got the keys of uh, hell and the grave, and he came back up and he actually was seen by 500 of his disciples and he actually ascended into the clouds like the scriptures say, if you believe that, wave at me. Come on, this is your confession. This is your confession. And all throughout church history, churches that have a strong confession are churches that make a difference in the world. If you have a weak confession, you don't mean anything to the world. It's a weak confession is, well, I don't know if he heals the sick. I don't know if he'll provide our needs. I don't know uh, if, if he's actually who he says. I don't know if he really rose again in the flesh or if he rose in the spirit. No, you got to have a strong confession. Your confession has got to be based on the word of God. If it says it, I confess it. Come on, a strong confession. And throughout church history, uh, churches have developed statements or confessions that they say out loud. One of them that dates back to the fourth century is the Apostles' Creed. I'd like us to all confess this with our mouths together. They're going to put it on the screen. I want you to say this. Don't say it mindlessly. Don't say it uh, just, just religiously. I want you to let the words of this confession sink into your heart. And as you say it, I want you to say, I believe this, okay? We're going we're to, at the end of this, we're all going to declare, I believe this, okay? Let's say it together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, 
and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the holy church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting, amen. Come on, elbow somebody say, I believe that. I believe that with all of my heart. Man, we can't have a weak confession. We have to have a strong confession. Not just in the house of God, but everywhere we go, we gotta have a strong confession. We've got to openly declare, like Peter said, this is who you are. The second part of this passage in verse 16, uh, Jesus says this, and upon this rock, I will build my church. So this is where there's a huge division in the church over the concept of the supremacy of uh, the Pope. And, And many people believe that when Jesus said, Peter, You're a rock, and I'm going to build the church on you. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, the only issue with this is that no man is the cornerstone. Only Christ is the cornerstone. In the book of Psalms, it it says that the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. There's no way Peter is the chief cornerstone because in his own epistle, 1 Peter chapter 2, he says this. I want you to see this. This is from the words of Peter himself. You are coming to Christ who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. This is Peter. This is the guy that, that everybody says. I mean, this, uh, there's millions of people who put their faith in the fact that Peter is the cornerstone of the church. But this is Christ Jesus, uh, this is him talking about it. And he says, uh, you're coming to Christ who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And then look what he says, because this is very important. And you are living stones. So you are coming to the cornerstone and you are stones that he is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priest. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. And the important thing here is the Greek language. Because in the, in the Greek language, Jesus does this play on words. And he says, and I say to you that you are Petros. Now, Jesus changed Peter's name. It was Simon, which means wavering reed. And Jesus says, you're no longer a wavering reed. You are a stone. The word Petros in Greek actually means stone. And then he says, and upon this Petra, which is a feminine word, which means cornerstone, I'm going to build my church. He uses two different words, and it's a play on words, and his point is this, that you are a rock, but on this confession of who I am, this cornerstone, that I'm going to build my church. And this is the point of this. Churches that change the world have a strong confession, but they also have a strong cornerstone. I'd like to encourage you that the moment we disconnect from Christ, we lose all life. The moment he is no longer the head of what we're doing, then we're just a social gathering. But if we stay obsessed with him, if we stay committed to him, If we stay connected to him, life flows through us. And you say, well, pastor, that's elementary. Many churches are not on the cornerstone. I was just recently in uh, the UK, and there in the UK, we passed by a church. And around the church, the church was surrounded with flags. And these weren't national flags. They weren't... uh, flags for organizations. This was a rainbow flag that surrounded the whole church. And the whole obsession with the church has become cultural issues that we should talk about and that we should dialogue about. And an obsession with culture and and the movements of culture. 
And I want to say that anything that the church becomes obsessed with and focused on other than the cornerstone himself is lifeless and will lead to death. But a church that stays obsessed and fixated on Christ, the head, how does a church stay focused on Christ? Well, he's got to be the topic of all conversation. And and when I say Christ, I'm talking about the second person of the Trinity, the man who came who was a carpenter who died for us and and that, that lives right now at the right hand of the Father. Our fixation on him, obsession with him, communion with him, intimacy with him, love for him, discussion about him, just Jesus, Jesus. And and the problem is we we can move beyond him. We can we can at one point talk about him, but then get into all kind of other things because we get bored with the conversation of Jesus Christ but he has got to be our all in all the cornerstone I mean he's got to be our model we he's got to be uh, the the relationship that we desire the most Christ the cornerstone a church that changes the world is firmly planted on the cornerstone Jesus Christ the third thing that we see in this passage is in verse 18 and he says and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Jesus' idea of his church is one that's busting down the gates of hell, one that is unconquerable, and it doesn't matter what comes against it, it will last. And this is a church with conviction. Conviction. I'm not leaving. I'm staying. Guys, let me edify you with something that just blessed me so much this past week. I was reading in the book of Revelation, And this is Jesus speaking, the one that I was just talking about, the Son of God. He was talking to the different churches. And he says, I walk amongst the lampstands of the churches. I believe that he walks among this church. He knows what we do. He knows what we think. He knows about the relationships. He knows everything that goes on here. And he passed out some praises, and he passed out some rebukes. And, and if you study, what did he praise these churches for? What was he excited about? He doesn't mention anything about their buildings. He doesn't mention anything uh, about their incredible strategies and systems and uh, organizational structures. He praises them for some things that we don't think about a lot. The number one praise that he gave to all of the churches was their ability to endure. I want you to see, I could, because I compiled all the things that they endured that he praised them for. He says that you have endured through hard times. You have endured through persecution. You have endured through suffering and poverty. You have endured through opposition. You have endured through devastation. You have endured through tough environments where it was almost impossible to serve me. You have endured. And for all of this endurance, he says, you're going to get something on the other side of this for your endurance. And he who endures to the end shall be saved. And, and I thank God for the moments where it's easy to love him and easy to praise him. But there are some moments where it's not as easy. There are some moments where you want to quit and you, your emotions are drained and you feel completely out of gas. And it's in those moments, if you're standing on the rock and your confession is strong, then you have conviction and you say, I'm going to endure all the way to the end. I don't know about you, but I ain't quitting. I'm going to keep going. And there's going to be moments where, you know what, my emotions are going to lie to me and say, oh, you should give in right now. But I'm telling you, he who endures to the end shall be saved. And I'm just going to tell you that in these last days, the love of many will grow cold. It's going to get harder and harder to stand. But we have to stand. We have to endure our conviction. And the gates of hell will not prevail against the true church. Hey, I want to just encourage you personally, just for a moment. Don't quit. Don't quit. Whatever you think, and I just I want to quit that. I gotta gotta get out of that. I gotta stop, gotta stop fellowshipping with these with this small group, or I've got to stop 
reading my Bible so much or I've got to stop, whatever it is, keep going. Keep going. The fourth thing that we see in this passage is in verse 19. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. This is also a text that is also often used uh, in wrong ways. It's most of the time, it's, uh, you know, I bind the devil and I loose the angels of God. And, and I believe that there is room in this text for different interpretations. But when Jesus says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, what does he mean by that? Because he wasn't just telling Peter, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Because in chapter 18, he told all of his disciples, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What is the key to the kingdom of heaven? It's the knowledge of the gospel that we literally carry the open door to God. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, which means that if we are a church that does not go out, reach out, share the testimony of Jesus Christ, then we are closing the door to the kingdom of heaven. Jesus rebuked the scribes and the Pharisees. He says, because you block people from entering into the kingdom of heaven. The, the keys of the kingdom of heaven is you know the truth that Jesus loves people. You know the truth that he gave his life for people. Every single lost person you come in contact with, you have an opportunity to either open the door or keep the door closed. This is a church with a commission, with a strong sense of evangelism, a strong sense of we have to go out. We cannot just exist to, to come together. Let me tell you, if your bar for your Christianity is Sunday attendance once every two weeks or once every four weeks, and, just, and, and man, you're just hitting the bar by getting to church, getting to church, this is not a missional, commissional mindset. A commissional mindset is I have the keys to the door of the kingdom of God, and I'm going to let as many people in as I possibly can. This is a phrase that implies authority. Christ is not going to personally evangelize every person that we know. He says, no, I've given you the keys. I've given you the keys. You let whoever in you want to let in. I've given you the keys. What a responsibility to have the keys to the kingdom of God. Wow. Missional churches change the world. And, and I'll just end with this. Bethany, I want us to be more missional than we've ever been. I want us to be more evangelistic than we've ever been. I want us to think about the globe. I want us to think about our, our local cities. I want us to be missional. I want you to catch the passion to share your faith, to evangelize, to reach out. Next year, we're sending over 500 missionaries around the world to go, bring, to go bring the gospel. This year we sent close to 200, but next year we're over doubling that. We're going like never before. And these are churches that change the world. Amen. So let's make this personal. What's your personal confession? Are you confessing out loud truth? Let's move this beyond the church and just talk about us personally. Some of you have sickness in your body. Some of you have despair in your soul. But your confession is not strong. Your confession is weak. If you're sick in your body, confess, by his stripes, I am healed. If you need provision, you say that by his glorious resources, he has provided for me everything I need. If you have depression in your soul, say, he's given me the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. What is your confession? Then personally, who is your cornerstone? What is your rock? Are you built on the foundation of Christ Jesus? What is your conviction? How strong are you? Can you make it to the end? 
And what is your commission? What are you living for? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you so much for what you're speaking to our hearts today, Lord. I pray that you use something that was spoken today to, to move us, Lord, further into your purpose, further into your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.